I've often been perturbed by this thought that we've had prime minister after prime minister and president after president who are professing Christians. And yet the position of the church and the position of the, the, the Christian community has continued to get worse. Um, laws are being passed that are contradictory to uh, a Christian worldview. And these laws are often being passed by Christians or people that profess to be Christians. Now, I am um, possibly, uh, I, I mean, I, I try to be charitable. So if someone says that they are a Christian, I don't presume to judge otherwise, unless they give me lots of good reasons to, to presume otherwise. Um, and I am uh, often willing to accept that people can think erroneously about politics, despite the fact that they are Christian. So I, I, I wondered as to why that is. And, and I kind of come to the conclusion that the reason why you can have a a prime minister that is willing to pass a law that changes the definition of marriage or a, a Christian prime minister that's willing to pass laws in favour of divorce or abortion, or even presidents, I mean, in America, who do similar look, such things. Like, you know, uh, I think in America, President Obama passed a law that compelled Catholic adoption agencies to hand children over to gay couples, despite the fact that it contradicts our faith. You know, I don't know, you can correct me if that particular factoid is wrong. Um, but but why is that? And I've come to the conclusion it's because Christians don't have a, 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 con, a political consciousness that is rooted in their faith as a people. And that what Christians need to become conscious of is that because we are a collective, because we are a people known as the church, we are the body of Christ, that that means that we have legitimate political interests in society that we have to defend and that we have to defend our own values, which give rise to our own culture. And that the way that we need to do that is, is by having a Christian political narrative that that is socially conservative, that seeks to defend things like marriage, <laughs> life, um, the family, um, that, that, that is, is concerned with justice, so opposes things like, um, you know, slavery, uh, leaving people in poverty, um, you know, has a care for the poor, but also have a, a third element, which is particularly unique, which is based upon solidarity with other Christians. The idea of, of, of political solidarity with other Christians in whatever they're going through, you know, um, particularly when the thing that they're going through is because they are a Christian. Um, and, and that's sort of like what, what a, a Christian political narrative looks like. And I think as, as society continues to change and continues to change in a way that's unchristian and even aggressive towards Christianity, the need for a, a political awakening amongst the church, a, a political consciousness amongst the church is increasing. We've just seen a, a coordinated attempt to wipe out Christians in Iraq and Syria. Catholics and Orthodox have suffered the brunt of that um, by ISIS who, who have deliberately attempted to wipe out the church there. Um, there are attempts to persecute Christians in, in Central African Republic. There are attempts to persecute Christians in North Africa. There are, there's persecution of Christians in Egypt. There's persecution of Christians in um, Pakistan. There's persecution of Christians in Burma. Uh, and, you know, and, and we as Christians, we've, we've, we, we are just so mind-bogglingly silent about this topic i am i am confounded as to why and my only conclusion is that it's because christians lack any kind of political narrative that is coherent my take and we we have a lot of talks and videos where we discuss this um about the political aspects of christian theology that's been lost as a result of a lot of developments in the west particularly the enlightenment um we absolutely yep. in orthodoxy believe that there has to be there is a doctrine of the civil state. Um, you can see this in the development of Christian theology. I don't believe in the evolution of dogma, but there is a development of the theology of the church fathers that's legitimate. And that development, in our view, is uh, getting greater and greater precision and, and clarifying. It's not the Roman Catholic no notion of sort of uh, evolving doctrine of Cardinal Newman or something like that. So 
there is a doctrine of the civil state, and I think a lot of uh, modern, even Orthodox in the West, are sort of unaware of this doctrine. In, in, in Russia, it's called Sobernost, where you have the idea of uh, community. Uh, in uh, our civil state theology, it's called symphonia, where you have a balance of powers between the civil state under God and the church under God. So both are under God. That's why you have the Byzantine double-headed eagle. And so they're both accountable, but in different ways, right? So the, the church is spiritual. It does have a priority and a uh, primacy of place over the state, but the state is not uh, anti-God. The state is not a thing that, I mean, we believe that if you believe the biblical account, God actually established the state. It's God that gave Noah the right to exact the death penalty. And if you follow from Genesis 9, where the death penalty is given, all the way up to Romans 13, where Paul uh, says that the state still has the authority from God as a diakonos. Paul uses the word and the term diakonos, which is a liturgical term for a deacon, of the civil state. And that's why in the Byzantine Symphonia notion, you have the emperor actually could go behind the iconostasis. He was actually seen as a lesser minister of God, you could say. We would say mm. that that is the norm, uh, even all the way up into Father Seraphim Rose, one of the more prominent uh, defenders of the book of Genesis in orthodoxy in, in the modern period. In his book, Nihilism, he says that the orthodox imperium is the providential mode of government that God has ordained for Christianity. And that's why for hundreds and hundreds of years, for millennia, the church has done coronation ceremonies where you have orthodox emperors and orthodox kings uh, chrismated uh, to be ministers under God. So in our view, this is not up for grabs. It's not something that nobody knows about. There is a political perspective that we're supposed to have. And although we don't necessarily apply everything from the Mosaic legislation into the civil sphere, it's not Judaizing and it's not a, a heresy to have the same view of the way that the church operated from after the Christianization of the empire with Theodosius all the way up until the Byzantine fall. You have this simple notion of symphonia, that there's a balance of powers, that the state has a duty to keep the moral law of God. That is the orthodox view. That it, and, yeah. to, and to deny that is actually just to adhere to uh, the uh, liberal and enlightenment principles that, that come out of the enlightenment. And that's why we don't really care for the enlightenment too much. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of legitimate criticisms of corruption in the state and in the church in the West at that time. But that doesn't mean that all the principles of uh, Voltaire and all these characters are, are necessarily the ideals that we want. So we do have to re- evaluate and reinstitute, reinstitute, excuse me, the notion of a Christian civil order. Uh, now that's not in our view, like our primary thing. We want to convert people first. We, we, we believe that there has to be a conversion on the inner side of man first. And that's what, if you look at the history of the church, the martyrs of the first three centuries is what led eventually to the conversion of the empire. We see that as a good thing. And so the same yeah, idea would apply now. We're not trying to like, we're oh, let's go convert a bunch of kings and then they'll they'll force everybody to be Orthodox and Christians. No, no, it's not like that. We 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 convert hearts first, and then it spills out into the civil sphere, right? So if we put things in the right order, eventually it will spill out into the political civil sphere when it's appropriate in our view. And so I think, so I think, I, and I one think, last one last point I'll make, and yeah. I'll let you have the floor, which is that. Um, I will give Islam credit for understanding that God is not divorced from the rest of society, right? I mean, Christianity, yeah. because of its acceptance in the West, at least, of pietism and of the influence of the Enlightenment, has been severely weakened because it doesn't believe that, oh, God doesn't have anything to do with the civil sphere. That's just me and my church life on Sunday, and then the rest of the week is just whatever you want. Why is that? Well, because Jesus is just a hippie prophet. So this Nestorian and Arian enlightenment conception of Jesus and not understanding that he's actually a uh, Ponto Crotter. He is actually King of Kings, right? That means that yep. he's actually over the civil state as well. I think, I think, and, and I think the, 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 the problem, the, the issue is that Christians have, have divorced the idea that we can hold politics as Christians. You know, we can, that, that, a member of the laity can hold the highest office in the land. And I think part of that comes from an abuse of or a misread or an erroneous reading um, of um, Matthew 22, 15, the, the idea of paying tribute to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. 
for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? It is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Now, why was that a controversial question? It was because the, the, the Jewish believers, the Jewish community didn't like the idea of having Caesar as their king. They saw God as their king. And the idea of having a, a pagan image on their coinage uh, broke the Jewish commandment. So it was kind of like, you know, where do you stand on this? And the Herodians were people who were supporters of the party of Herod, um, who was the son of Herod the Great, and the idea of um, him being the puppet king of the, the, the Roman occupiers. But Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. Now, why were they amazed? People were paying the poll tax. So it sounds at a very surface level. Jesus is just saying, go along with whatever, you know, he's going along with the current thing. But it's in his answer that it is the, 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 the amazingness of his answer, because he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God, the things that are God's. Well, according to the Old Testament, what belongs to God? He says in the Psalms that the earth is the Lord's and everything upon it. So when Jesus says, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God, he's saying everything belongs to God. And that means politics belongs to God. It means political authority belongs to God. It means political office belongs to God. It means the nation state belongs to God. And we as Christians must render our political office to God. We must render the state to God. We must render our political activism to God. But in the Enlightenment, what happened was this verse was used as a way of separating politics from religion. And so lots of people have this erroneous view that the church, and I use this in the broadest sense, that the body of believers, me and you as part of the church, the laity, that the church should stay out of politics and that religion is just this private thing that we keep to ourselves and we don't infuse it with politics. Well, we've seen where that leads and it's not led to anywhere good. Perfect. So I think it's time that the church has a rethink on this topic and that actually we see that we should use any influence or authority that we have in society to nudge and to be a light that shines out on a hill, to be the salt, the, the, the yeast that leavens a whole, to be salt in the earth and to, to deaconate, to move society in a Christian direction, you know, and that is about rendering to God what belongs to God, because Jesus is saying that Caesar belongs to God. And that's why this answer was amazing. That's why, because he managed to get out of the, the trap that they'd laid for him without ever compromising the truth of scripture. And I think that Christians need to recapture this vision of, of seeking a Christian politic, a Christian society. And what I mean by that is the idea that we are a Christian politic. We are a Christian society in this world that we exist. You're, you, you were talking about the theology, the, 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 the political narrative that developed after the conversion of Caesar. But we don't live in that world now. We, we live in a world where many Caesars are against Christ back as actually the, at the time when the, the New Testament was written. There are many Caesars that are against Christ. Obama was against Christ. Cameron was against Christ. Merkel is against Christ. There are many Caesars now. The Caliphates were all against Christ. You know, uh, all of these Caesars are against Christ. Stalin, Hitler, they were all against Christ. We as Christians now are in a world where, where we have to re... We are, we're, we're in a pre-Constantine time and we have to re-envision what it means to reconvert the empire, as it were, to, to reconvert the states that we live in. And, and an example of, of, of someone who's done that to some degree is the, the president of Hungary, you know, who's very much about incorporating the idea of Christian identity into his political narrative, even to the point that he has established a political office, a department of state that is dedicated to helping persecuted Christians. I mean, one, one of the arguments that's often used about, um, often used against this idea is this idea that 
you know, it was never intended that the church should be in power. How do you respond to that? What's your thought on that? Yeah, it's a misunderstanding of uh, the predictions and prophecies of the Old Testament. In fact, uh, many times in Isaiah, in the latter chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah predicts that the church will uh, actually have tremendous power and influence in the world. Uh, in fact, kings and emperors and, and queens will submit to uh, the law as it goes forth from Zion. And we know that those are all predictions of the Messianic period and therefore of the church. So when Jesus established the kingdom, if you look at Daniel 2, uh, the kingdom that the, that the Messiah sets up is the one that will actually conquer the empire under which the Messiah is born. So Daniel actually predicts in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 9 the conversion of the Roman Empire. And I've made uh, many videos and discussions about this as a powerful uh, prophetic testament to the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. So it's just a basic misunderstanding of uh, what, the, what the doctrine of the New Testament actually is. And it's assuming that it's out of accord with all of those Old Testament prophecies of the uh, victory and power of the church. In fact, all of those prophecies and predictions, for example, about the covenant curses and blessings in Deuteronomy 28 and the latter chapters of Leviticus, those are actually applied in Revelation 2 and 3 by Jesus himself to the church. The covenant curses and blessings model is applied to the church. And Jesus says that if you are faithful to me, I will actually give you victory over your uh, oppressors and over your um, persecutors. Uh, so we aren't necessarily out first and foremost to seek political power. We are out first and foremost to convert the nations. And then political power itself, again, is from God. And you have to deny Ultimately, the root of this in Genesis, and this is, of course, why a lot of people deny uh, the text of Genesis. Uh, we're big defenders of Genesis here. But uh, God actually gave the, uh, the, the right to exact the death penalty to Noah. State rulers are not outside the authority and providence of God. Even pagan emperors, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll notice that Nebuchadnezzar was under the providence of God. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar this, that you need basically the whole first several chapters, chapters of Daniel is about Nebuchadnezzar being humbled and realizing that he has to submit to God. So uh, the holistic interpretation of the Bible from Genesis all the way up through, God consistently holds rulers, even pagan rulers, accountable to his moral law, accountable to the Ten Commandments. Um, mm -hmm. so, so even though God providentially can use the pagan nations to, for example, in the Old Testament, chastise Israel many times over, it doesn't mean that those rulers aren't accountable. In fact, in Isaiah, when God talks about using the Babylonians against uh, Israel as a chastisement, God says, I will then turn around and chastise the Babylonians for their paganism and their idolatry. So uh, civil rulers are bound to Christ. They have to submit to Christ. Um, and that's always been the, the doctrine of the church. Now, there was some confusion in the first second century of the church because some people like Tertullian and, and other people who didn't end up being kind of our accepted theologians who were early writers, they thought that, well, maybe the end of the world is coming really soon and, and maybe we're not supposed to have anything to do with the civil state. But, if, but the church, for the most part, in its saints and in its recognized theologians, you can actually read St. Clement, the letters of St. Clement, early, early on affirmed the death penalty and they affirmed the uh, uh, duty of the ruler to God, right? So this mm. is all just made up enlightenment nonsense. So there, is a, there is a political narrative right there in the church fathers. I think many Christians have this, this, this uh, certain Christians have a, a, a sort of false concept that it seems like only non-Christians are, are destined to be instituted into political office. And it's, you know, they read Romans 13 where it says, every person is to be subject in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, they use that, but then they have this really weird interpretation that states that that only applies to non-Christian political authority. That, that actually it's all the pagans, the Muslims and the communists and the fascists that are destined to be in charge. But, but if you take that worse seriously, then when Constantine converts or when a Christian president is in power, you know, then, then that obviously applies to them as well. And, and they are still a disciple of Christ, even though they are in political office. 
And then lots of Christians will, will will have this idea, well, you know, it is a Christian who's who's in political office, so they have to conduct themselves honestly and they have to be fair. And they sort of treat it like, you know, like you 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 would behave in 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 any everyday work that you might do that doesn't have a, a greater, wider social implication, and that you just have to act with integrity. And they reduce the idea of a Christian in political office to simply questions of integrity. But that is that is not actually what natural law demands. That is not what what justice demands. It's not what Christian discipleship demands. It means that a Christian has to pass Christian policies Perfect. based upon a Christian worldview. Absolutely. And that might mean that they have to be pragmatic, like like Constantine was pragmatic. He didn't just become a Christian and then decide, right, I'm going to destroy all the pagan temples. He just did what was politically pragmatic for the good of the church, and he, he passed the Edict of Milan, and he made it legal to be a Christian, and he made Christianity one of the the, the official Roman religions. And then he allowed restitution, and he and he re, you know compensated Christians for their losses. But he didn't suddenly start going around making you know the ancient pagan Roman religions illegal. You know, so you so you, you've you've sometimes got to be pragmatic because we still live in a sinful world. But Christians should have a political vision and they should seek to pass Christian laws. And so when a Christian finds themselves in the political office, they should believe that they are there because God put them there, which means that they have a purpose Absolutely. for being there. Yeah. You know, and if you're truly to be governed by Christian discipleship, then that means that the cause of the persecuted church has to rank really, really high in your list of priorities. It's got to be in the top three. You know, it's kind of like you cannot be a Christian. And when you have the opportunity to intervene against the persecution of Christians, you do nothing. It cannot be that, that when you have the actual ability and means and opportunity to try and alleviate the persecuted church, that you do nothing when you have that power and authority. Me and you, Jay, we, we, we're never going to get close to that kind of office. But anyone who ever, ever, ever hears this, whoever's listening to this, you know, whatever position you're in, in, in legitimate authority, you're there because God put you there. And that means that you have a purpose for being there. Yeah, our, our, now, mod, our model is uh, you look at something like the Code of Justinian. I mean, we, we, he's a saint and an Orthodox emperor because he, I mean, he was also a theologian, right? I mean, we believe he was Orthodox. We believe that he defined and laid out some uh, solid Christological writings and confirmed the Orthodox faith. So he is a model uh, monarch, as are, you know, great kings of Serbia, as are uh, many Russian kings and so forth. So that's the norm. That's the classical view. And uh, I really appreciate that, that you are bringing attention to this because the, the political sphere has to be governed by the moral law of God. But then you've got the question of, you know, what, polit politically, what do we do when we're faced by caliphates and communists and mm. Nazis? You know, the, the, the reality is that Christians, if you're a Christian, then that means that you have to pursue the heart of God. You have to pursue the things of God. And that means the justice and peace of God. And that therefore ideologies that are opposed to the justice and the peace of God, we as Christians must oppose. You know, the, the limits of political authority over the church were limited when when um, Peter, um, let me just find the passage in the book of Acts. Peter and John were arrested. Sahandrin basically said to them, stop preaching in the name of Christ. So we read from verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further amongst the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, it's really important to recognize that this was the civil authority. 
This was the civil authority of the time. These people were speaking in their office. They were speaking as the legitimate civil authority and they were giving a command. So these Romans 13 kind of fundamentalists who believe that you should just surrender everything to the state and obey the state in every regard, no matter what it says, listen to the next bit. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right, morally right, whether it is morally right, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. In other words, they're saying that there is an authority higher than the civil authority. There is an authority higher than the parliament. There's an authority higher right. than the president. There's an authority higher than the secular authority. And wherever that secular authority is opposed to God, Christians must be rebels. Perfect. Right. We, that's why there's martyrs. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if we just submitted to anything that the, uh, that the emperor said or the, that the pagan ruler said, then uh, there wouldn't be martyrs. You would just sacrifice to the, yeah. to the gods. And you, and you would the martyrs were deemed as criminals. Right, right. But you look at the church today and, and you hear these wimpy Christians quoting Romans 13 to try and avoid any conflict with the secular state. Right. Yeah, that's total nonsense. Yeah. And, and, and we as Christians, we need to rediscover this theology of martyrdom, this spirituality of martyrdom, because right now the, the, the liberal Western states are moving away from Christ. And the, it's reaching a point now where Christians have to choose who are we going to follow. Are we going to follow the secular liberal state? You know, when, when the less secular liberal state is telling you that you have to speak a lie and you have to call a man a woman and a woman and a man, and you have to, you know, go along with abortion and, you you know, you have to go along with the whole liberal progressive agenda about definitions of the family and, you know, the ideas of sexuality. And if you dare to speak out about these things, you're guilty of thought crimes. If you speak out against you know, multiculturalism, you're guilty of thought crimes. And we're beginning to see people being politically persecuted in the West for these things. Like, we've got a choice to make. Are we just going to go along with the state? You know, the, the, the comfy mattress is our God kind of spirituality that, that permeates so much of the Church of England is not going to cut the kind of uh, intolerance that we're seeing. And it certainly wouldn't survive in a caliphate. You, we've got to rediscover this idea of martyrdom. We've got to rediscover this idea that actually... You know, where the state is opposed to God, then 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 that means that we're in conflict with the state, you know, and that means that Christians must actively work to bring down those uh, political officers, those powers that be those powers and authorities right. um, that are in opposed to the gospel. Yeah, that's why I'm a constant critic of classical liberalism. Classical liberalism will never be able to stand up against Islam. Islam will crush the uh, degeneracy that classical liberalism promotes and allows because it is based on an atheistic presupposition. All right, we're going to have to take the super chats because uh, I've got a debate sure. debate coming up here in a little bit. So Slav K for 10 pounds, he says, Islam came around 600 years after Christ. Martyrs died for nothing until some pagan guy saw an angel. The only thing that they say in response to Acts 4.12 and Galatians 1.8 1, is that the New Testament is fake. So I think you're hint hinting at the sort of... Uh, regurgitated arguments that you hear from uh, Islamic apologists. Would you agree that uh, the only thing that they that they say is uh, the New Testament is fake? Is that kind of like a, a fallback that you usually hear from from Islamic apologists? Yeah, when, when Muslims, Muslims will make this fake attempt at engaging with the scripture by misquoting textual verses. But then when you slam all their arguments by using the whole of the scripture, their, 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 their fallback position is always, well, the scriptures were all corrupt and they're not trustworthy. But yet I am not yet to, able to meet a Muslim that's provided any evidence of an original. Because if you're going to say that something is corrupted, you've got to be able to evidence that there was an original that it was corrupted from. And the fact of the matter is that Muslims have presented no evidence at all for their idea of an injil that was first given, that is an incorrupted text, that was somehow lost. There's no evidence of such a text existing. Arguments that reference Q and P in terms of textual criticism. Well, these are the sayings of Jesus that we have in the Gospels. You know, that, that's why there's correlation between the synoptics. They're not proof of some, um, they're not proof of some uh, Islamic injil. They're, they're texts that, 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 that if, if, it, if the theory is true, they're, they're, they're evidence of a Christian text a sort of manual of, of the sayings of Jesus that was permeating the, the Christian community. 
And if you read the beginning of Luke, you know, that that's more than fits within a Christian worldview because Luke actually references the fact that other people had written down accounts even before he'd written down his. So where's this Injil, guys? Where's the evidence of an right. Injil? Okay, so uh, Emil, uh, who uh, monopolized the chat and wouldn't shut up about this, it did end up getting banned, but he left a super chat and he said, Jay, is Mary the mother of God uh, only the mother of his humanity? And it's human nature uh, and do natures die now again i i answered this question multiple times when i said that there was one divine person present cyril uses the formula of a soul subject present for all of christ's incarnate actions who is the divine person of the logos there's no created human hypostasis in christ i've done countless lectures on this i lecture through the entirety of the exposition of orthodox faith so i'm really um i'm really depressed that you monopolize the chat with this basic mistake so I'm going to read to you the section of John Damascus's Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, chapter 26, book 3, where he says, Concerning the passion of our Lord and the impassibility of his divinity. Did you hear me? The yeah. word of God endured all of this in the flesh. What did I say? I said he died in his flesh. He is a divine person who underwent death in his flesh. That's his human nature. While the divine nature alone was passionless and de remained devoid of passion. Can you read that? His divine nature was passionless and remained devoid of passion. So his human nature died. Does that mean that Mary is Christodokos? No, we're not an historian. So there's two ways that you could understand this. You can understand this in the way that St. Cyril does, who invented the term communicatio idiomatum, which is the communication of properties, which is that whatever's true of either nature can be spoken of the whole Christ. It doesn't mean that the divine hypostasis died as a divine hypostasis. He underwent death. He, yes, that subject in his human nature. His divine hypostasis did not die. Perfect. And as John goes on to talk about the death and descent of Christ, he makes that very clear. The word of God, the logos, remained inseparable from the soul and the body even at his death, and his subsistence continued to be one. That refutes everything that you said. Let's move on to and, and the title the the title Theotokos is obviously a defense of Christ's divinity. Right. It's a defense of the fact that the divine person that she get the only person that she gave birth to is a divine person. Right. Yep. So did he get his human nature from her? Yes. But the person that she gave birth to is the Logos. I have lectured on St. Cyril against Nestorius for years. I don't know why you would even come in here and make this silly argument. Alfonso Corral, $10. Here's some mammon. Very, very interesting conversation so far. Well, thank you, Alfonso. Appreciate that. Uh, not a verse five bucks. She says, Jay, good, amazing guest. Love to see Bob the Builder as a regular. Hello, Bob, brother. You're a legend at Speaker's Corner. So uh, thank you for that. Thanks, bro. And, God bless uh, you. I don't see any more super chats, but that's okay. So, uh, Bob, do you want to promote your own channel or Soko Films or both? Which one do you prefer? So both. So, so yeah, I mean, if you could share the link to both. There, there's I'll two add that channels. One. Yeah, I, I put the Soko yeah. Films link uh, in the description first. Um, so I'll add your live channel as well. But everybody, if you want to uh, subscribe to Bob's Apologetics, uh, go to the link in the description of the show, which is to Soko Films. Uh, and then again, yes, so I will be debating the set of privationist, not a set of a contest, but by the way, they're going to fall into the same problems uh, in uh, a little bit here. Let's see, what is it? It's 1240 in one hour on Ralph's channel on D live. So uh, come hear that debate. Uh, this guy made a big stink in the last couple of weeks and uh, almost all of his videos are insults and uh, um, ad hominems uh, and cussing at me. So I don't know that this is going to be much of a debate. Uh, I think he was trying to debate me, debate me into this to get attention. Turns out the guy uh, channels aliens. He believes uh, uh, UFOs bombed Mars. Uh, he does past life regression therapy. He believes in reincarnation. So I don't think this is going to be much of a debate. But because a lot of people really wanted to see this, I agreed to it. So uh, that will be at 1.50 Central Time. And thank you, Bob the Builder. Everybody go subscribe to Bob. Check out his debates. He's got tons and tons of debates uh, at Speaker's Corner that are video uh, on YouTube. You can watch all those. Um, Bob, will you come back again for another chat? Yes, absolutely. It's been a pleasure, Jay. Um, what's that, this, this channel called, this particular? Bob the Builder Soko Films. So this one is called Bob the Builder Soko Films, if you want to subscribe to that. The link will appear with Jay. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Jay. I'm sure that lots of people are going to benefit and that the church will hopefully be edified by this. And hopefully some Muslims 
um, will actually engage with you know what Christians really believe as opposed to what their Dawah team tells them that we right. believe. And um, you know, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Let's let's do it again sometime. And uh, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm appreciative of all the work that you do. You know, it's a uh, it's a great thing. All right, thank you very much. And again, if you want to check out uh, my stuff, go to jasonalsis.com, subscribe to the channel below. Uh, you can get my books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, where I cover symbolism and film. Uh, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it. God bless. Have a good night.